Pastor Scott, uh, thank you for those gracious words and for your support, for our church's support. It's such a joy to be with all of you today. It's been a joy to be here for the past two years. My final Sunday will be June 4th, and I'm excited that for many of you, I'll get to stay in touch. We'll get to see each other again. But today is my last opportunity to speak and to share God's word with you here at SMCC. And about three months ago, I was thinking and asking the Lord, if I'm given one more chance to share on a Sunday morning, what should I talk about? And the Lord put it on my heart to tell you my story. In Revelation chapter 12, those who overcome the enemy, the accuser, are described this way. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Sharing our testimonies, the story of what God has done, is a part of walking forward in the victory that Christ has won for us. And I believe that as I share some of the truths God's taught me, they'll, they'll resonate with you because God is teaching all of us the age-old, timeless truth from his word to apply to our lives today. You can open up your Bible to Isaiah 58, the section of scripture that we'll be looking at together. And let's start in prayer. Father in heaven, yours is the voice that gives life. Let us hear from you today. Silence every other voice. Still the distractions within and around us. And tune us into you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to take you back, not to my birth, not to my early childhood, but to a scene that took place seven years ago in a little home in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where a 20-some-year-old young woman was on the floor of her living room, crying hysterically and writhing in agony because of the torment of soul she was experiencing. At this time in my life, I'd begun to awaken to the anaconda of anorexia that had wrapped itself around me and was squeezing the life out of me little by little, day by day. But no matter how aware I was of the voices in my head that were controlling me, that were telling me, no, 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 you cannot eat, you must not eat, you shall not eat, I didn't know how to resist their power, and I didn't know how to get free. So alone, I cried out, desperate, hopeless, in despair, and there was no one around to hear my cries except God. How did the Lord bring a young woman from a pit of destruction like that to being able to stand before you today? Well, he did what he does for anyone who allows him to transform their lives. Jesus said in John chapter 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God wants to set you and me free today to worship him authentically. Pastor Scott has been preaching this month on worship, not just as a song, not worship as a section of a Sunday morning service, but worship as the devotion of an, a whole life offered to God. So let's turn to Isaiah 58 and start in verse chapter 1 as we look at some truth that sets us free for authentic worship. Starting in verse 1 together. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness, that did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you see it not? 
Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself. Is it to bow down his head like a reed and spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? God had a controversy with his people. The amazing thing about this passage to me is that in the prophetic word Isaiah was giving to his people, God is portraying both sides of the conversation for us. As the Lord calls out his people's sin, brings them a word of conviction and rebuke and says, you need to repent. The people's response to God is, how can you call us sinful? We're the epitome of faithfulness and devotion. We're doing all the right things. We're making ourselves miserable to make you happy. You're the one who's not listening. You're the one who's not answering our prayers. You're the one not upholding your end of the bargain. And as arrogant as that stance is to take towards the holy God, I can relate because I've been there. You see, the time in my life surrounding the episode that I just described to you was one in which I seemed to be doing all the right things. I was a Christian. I was active in church and in ministry. I was practicing spiritual disciplines. I was attending Bible conferences, listening to teaching on prayer and fasting. In fact, I decided that if prayer and fasting was as powerful and important as I was taught, that I'm going to devote as much as I can of my life to that pursuit. I prayer walked my neighborhood. I joined prayer groups in my community. I fasted for everything I could think to fast for. And along the way, simultaneously, I was struggling with some physical health issues for which I didn't have a known medical cause. So I prayed about that too, and I decided that I was going to pursue alternative medical solutions, and I continued restricting my diet more and more, because you can fix anything in your life if you just do the right things, right? Over a period of 18 months, I lost about 80 pounds. I was living the American woman's dream. So if I was doing all the right things, why was I falling apart inside? Why was I struggling to cope with daily life, having regular, uncontrollable meltdowns, physically exhausted by standing up for an hour watching kids at the daycare playground or walking up half a flight of stairs to my bedroom? Why was I consumed by a mental darkness that I didn't even have a name for at the time? If I was doing all the right things, why was my life falling apart? Well, I was missing a very important principle. And it was something that God also was trying to get through to his people way back in Isaiah's day. Doing things for God does not replace knowing God. Doing things for God is no substitute for walking with God. So you can walk a thousand miles for God and never take one step with him. Some of you are financial gurus. You can crunch numbers in your head that would break my calculator. But some of you, maybe like me, have been in a church context or a religious environment long enough to become experts in spiritual economics. You've learned all of the equations and the formulas that human beings have invented to manipulate our creator. If I do this then God does that. If I pray this way every day, then my problems will go away. If I give this amount to that ministry, or if I 
tithe to my church, then I'm never supposed to have financial problems. I'm never supposed to feel financial need. If I follow so-and-so's book on parenting, then my kids will turn out like that. Yeah, we've been experts at finding formulas to get what we want from God. But as Pastor Scott preached last Sunday, religion is often the greatest enemy of authentic worship. I encourage you to go back and listen to that message on YouTube if you missed it, because he talked about how we can be performing all the external actions of serving God without having our heart connected. We view our connection with God transactionally instead of relationally. He becomes this cosmic vending machine and we insert our spiritual currency of choice and we inform him of the blessing that we desire and we expect that we are entitled to receive that within our timeline. God isn't interested in your spiritual currency or mine. In fact, in Isaiah 64, God talked about the good works that people do to try to impress him this way. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, filthy rags, trash. So if the Lord doesn't value our performance or our productivity, what is he after? I love how Micah 6, 7 through 8 spells it out for us. Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? That was the Old Testament spiritual currency. Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body for my own sin? I mean, how big of a sacrifice does God want me to make? What do I have to do to please him? Mankind, he has told you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. He wants your heart. He wants you. The Lord continues in Isaiah 58 to describe how authentic worship plays out through our lives. We'll pick up in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose? In other words, if you really want to express the apex of spiritual devotion, try doing what matters most to me. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, God cares about the freedom of his people. Liberating people from oppression, from bondage, from injustice. It matters to him. Why? The Lord gives us some pretty great insight in the words that he spoke to confront Pharaoh in the book of Exodus when his people, the Israelites, were being held captive in slavery in the land of Egypt. God sent Moses with his words to Pharaoh, and this is what he said in Exodus 8.1. And not just that time, but over and over and over again to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Let my people go 
so that they may worship me. See, God's purpose for your freedom and for mine is to be able to offer him a whole life of worship of which he alone is worthy. We can only have one ultimate master at a time in our lives. Anything else that is controlling us, that is dominating us, is stealing our worship from the only one who deserves it. Now, yes, freedom is a social issue. It is. But I believe that it's also a soul issue. And before we look around at the social justice causes that are worthy of involvement, we need to look within. Because Jesus described slavery like this in John chapter 8. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but his son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus came to set you free. It's time to get serious about getting free. There was a word in Isaiah 58 that described bondage. It's the word yoke. A yoke is basically a wooden bar. It could be a wooden harness that was on a pair of oxen or an animal to harness them to the burden they were carrying. And even the Hebrew word is real simple. It's real basic. It describes just a bar. That's the word. Because a bar might be laid across the shoulders of a slave or a servant so they could carry the heavy jugs of water or whatever burden they needed to move. And over and over, in Isaiah 58, he talks about taking that yoke off. You know, it's amazing to me is that when I think about what Jesus bore on his way to the crucifixion, he was carrying a wooden bar across his back, too. In fact, John 19 tells us they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross. Historical sources show us that often that was the cross beam of the cross laid across the shoulders, the back of that condemned prisoner, possibly up to 100 pounds in weight. So when Jesus told us in Matthew 11, my yoke is easy, it's because he wants to take away the heaviness, the weight of the oppression that you and I carry. He bore it for you. He carried it for you. I'm very familiar with what bondage feels like. I'll never forget the day in July of 2016 when a woman who know, knew what I was going through drove me to our church building. And there in the conference room were my pastor and his wife, who is a, a trained nutritionist, a prayer warrior friend, and my sweet sister-in-law, Nicole. And they had a group intervention with me. They said, Rebecca, are you able to admit that you have anorexia? And I looked at the floor and I said, yeah, I guess. Because it was hard. And sometimes denying the chains around us is more comfortable than acknowledging that we're not free. They said, Rebecca, are you willing to take steps of action towards recovery? And I said, I want to, but I don't know how. Because in my mind, I'd been trying. I'd been trying for months already, trying to deny it, trying to avoid it, trying to control it, trying to manage it, trying to fix it. And all my trying, I was still dying. And that is why what my church family said to me next was what made the difference in my life. They said, Rebecca, we'll help you. 
and they did. They got involved in my mess. They picked up the pieces of my brokenness. Like the friends who carried a paralyzed man to Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, they carried me to the feet of the Savior until I could stand up on my own two feet and keep walking with the Savior. They invested in me financially, emotionally, spiritually, consistently, sacrificially. We've got to get serious about getting free. But we're not going to get free until we get honest about what is holding us back and until we get real with someone who can walk with us into freedom. I don't know what your bondage looks like. It probably looks different from mine. See, bondage doesn't always look like a chemical dependency or a psychiatric condition. Sometimes, sometimes bondage looks like the scrolling on the phone, scrolling, 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 until you lose all awareness of your surroundings, of the reality around you. Sometimes it looks like the thing that we call our guilty pleasure because it makes us feel a little less guilty about it. Sometimes bondage looks like our coping mechanism of choice when we never say no to it, but we have a thousand excuses for it. Sometimes it looks like the blind spot in your life other people try to call you out on, and you always have an answer because they're wrong, and they've been wrong for 25 years, right? And sometimes bondage looks like the memory from your past that you rehearse to people over and over and over again, so no one will forget how you've been hurt and how you've been wronged. And sometimes bondage looks like the fears or the expectations that we have for our future that keep us up at night, that wake us up in the morning, that distract us during the day. I don't know what your bondage looks like, but I know the one who can set you free. And whatever is mastering you is stealing your worship from Jesus. It's time to get serious about getting free. The word shows us in Isaiah 58 what a life looks like as we walk forward following God's ways. We'll continue starting in verse 10. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Just let that image soak in for you. The life that God envisions for you is flourishing, is fulfillment, is freedom, is fruitfulness, is restoration. How do we get that? Flourishing follows obedience. Remember the little word that that passage started with? If. If you come into agreement with God and do things his way, starting with repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. But obedience doesn't end there, does it? One of the things that I love about Germany are the white lines of the crosswalks. Now, yes, we have crosswalks in the United States. I get that. But the crosswalks that I'm most familiar with from growing up are that little painted lane across the street with a light that tells you when to walk and when you're risking your life if you walk. 
And so many of the crosswalks here, not all of them, but many are different. They're not controlled by a light all the time. Sometimes they're just broad, painted white lines on the street. And there's so much power in those white lines. As soon as the pedestrian steps off the sidewalk, he owns the road. That section of pavement belongs to him. He doesn't have to look and see if traffic is coming. It doesn't matter if it's a bus or a truck or the chancellor of Germany barreling down the street at 100 kilometers per hour. That vehicle will stop for the pedestrian on the white lines because the entire authority of the Bundesrepublik of Deutschland is standing behind the pedestrian on the white lines. You know I'm right. And some of you, it drives you crazy. <laughs> but the reason that I love it is because it's a powerful picture of what we receive as we walk in obedience to the revealed will of God. We receive confidence, we receive authority, we receive the blessing of God in a unique way. And James describes that like this in James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Walk on God's white lines. Don't worry about the traffic that's coming at you, and he will stop. <laughs> it sounds so simple. And the reality is that the Bible is not promising a perfect life to those who obey God. In fact, Jesus actually promised trouble to those who follow him. It doesn't mean that we won't have difficulties, that we won't have pain, that we won't have suffering, that we won't experience injustice, but it does mean that we will be able to say with the Apostle Paul, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, struck, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. It means that your life can be overrun with the traffic of trials and troubles and temptations, but you won't be run over by them. So many of us, we spend so much time and energy in our lives trying to blaze our own trail, trying to find our own path, trying to create our own rules. And we kind of feel a little miffed that God would presume to tell us what to do. And who does he think he is? But we don't realize what David understood. He knew and described in Psalm 18, he brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The white lines of God's will are not to give you confinement, but to give you confidence. They're not to restrict you, they're to rescue you. The white lines of God's will don't imprison you, they set you free. Flourishing follows obedience. But the question is, how do we know God's will? How do I know what God wants? beautiful thing is it's not that hard. The white lines of God's will are clearly laid out in the red letters of God's word. The white lines of God's will are clearly laid out in the red letters of God's word. Many traditional or older editions of the Bible print the words of Christ during his earthly ministry in red print, setting it apart do you remember what Jesus had said in John 8? The first verse we looked at. If, you, if my words abide in you, you are my disciple. He told us in John 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He made his will clear to us. And some of us are chasing what, what is obscure in God's will, but we're not obeying what is obvious in God's will. Let's take a, an example from Matthew 28. The very last words that Jesus spoke to his followers before ascending back into heaven 
after his death and resurrection are these. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It starts with his authority. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus Christ didn't give us a direction, a, a vocation. He gave us a direction. He gave us a mission. Go. Cross the street. And as you go, bring others with you. Teach others how to walk in the white lines of my will. About two years into my journey of solid, concentrated work on personal recovery, personal wholeness in my life, God had brought a lot of changes in me through the support of my family, my church, a recovery support group, professional help. But I began to wonder, what am I getting better for? What am I moving towards? You see, when I graduated high school in 2010, I was convinced that the next major assignments that God had in my life were marriage and motherhood. And here I was, I'd been doing some great things. I loved teaching violin, I loved working in a daycare, but I was still standing on the curb eight and a half years later, waiting for something that wasn't even on the horizon yet. I had a Skype conversation with lifelong friends of my family who are missionaries serving in Switzerland. And Tom and Linda said to me, Rebecca, you know that God has put dreams and desires in your heart from the time you were little. And they were right. I was called by the Lord to be a missionary at the age of six. I'd had a keen, undying interest in Germany and German-speaking people from the time I was eight or nine. They said, Rebecca, what if you take a step in the direction of what God has already put inside you and see what he does? So with their invitation as my inspiration, I began to plan a six-week exploratory trip to Europe to travel around to visit missionaries and ministries here and just to see what God wanted to show me. But along the way, in the months leading up to that trip, I struggled through repeated bouts of insecurity and second-guessing and doubt and fear because I was afraid that I might misstep, that I might be going the wrong direction, and what if I stepped outside the will of God or I went the wrong way and I got hit by a truck in life? What if I messed it all up? Gradually, I've been learning couple things. One, that I'm not big enough to ruin God's plan. I've also been learning that God doesn't set the obedient up for failure. He sets them up for victory. You know, when we walk obediently in what God has made most clear, he'll take care of the things that aren't clear yet. If you're crossing a street at night, in Germany here, like the one shown on the slide. And you really want to make sure you don't stumble on that street. Where do you go? You go to the crosswalk, because that's where the light is shining. And the light of God's personal will for your life will always shine in the path of the revealed will that he's made available to all of us in his word. I came to Europe for six weeks in 2019, and I returned home knowing that God was indeed calling me to get ready to move overseas. Several months later, as I was actively preparing my life for the unknown transition, the Lord said, it's time to go. And I don't want you to just go somewhere to go somewhere. I want you to go to Germany because I put that on your heart for a reason. Within a week, the invitation had come to my inbox from Pastor Matt and Stacy Leedy to serve here at SMCC with them as a children's ministry director. 
And so I applied and was accepted to become a missionary associate through Assemblies of God World Missions to fill that role. I want to tell you how grateful I am for the amazing leadership that I've been blessed to serve under, Pastor Matt and Stacy, and now Pastor Scott and Kathy Miller. Both couples and the leadership of our church have poured into my life, have mentored me, have invested in me, and I'm very grateful to them, but I'm also grateful to all of you because I can't tell you what a privilege it is to see God working through you, to see the fruit in your lives, to see the Holy Spirit reaching into this community, to see our amazing team of children's ministry volunteers pouring in to this next generation. God is doing great things here. And we continue to walk in the white lines as we go after his will, we go after his heart. So I'll be returning home I've completed the two-year term that I initially signed up for. And I'll be returning on June 6th, as Pastor Scott said, to connect with the partners and supporters that have made it possible for me to be here and to continue building that team so I can return to Germany, Lord willing, next year for a new assignment working with Jordan and Shay Campbell in their church plant. I'm excited about what God has ahead, what God has ahead here and in the States, in Grafenvir. He's working. He's definitely working. But we get to be a part of it. God doesn't invite us into the Great Commission because he needs help. He invites us into the Great Commission because he wants us to experience the wonder of being a part of the eternal work that he's doing. So I want to encourage you today to ask the Holy Spirit what might be holding you back from authentic worship. You see, worship is not just a song. It's not just a section of a Sunday morning service. It's a whole life offered to God. And the Apostle Paul phrased it this way in Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I don't know what might be holding you back today. If it's religion, a transactional view of your connection with God, maybe it's some place of bondage, some, something in your life that you have never overcome Maybe it's a fear, a fear that's holding you on the curb and preventing you from stepping out in obedience to the Lord. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you to surrender that to Jesus today, to give it to him, ask him to bring a change there, and commit to obeying what he tells you to do. And I also encourage you to tell someone, because we're not going to get free alone I need you to break my chains, and you need me to help you take your yoke off. We get free as we follow the truth of God's word together in community. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you and we praise you for the work that you are doing in us as a community of believers, but also individually. We praise you that you're not satisfied leaving us in our chains, in our bondage. We praise you that you go after those places where we're holding back or where we're stuck. And you set us free. I give you glory for what you've done in my life, and I also give you glory for what you're doing in the lives of my brothers and sisters today. We surrender to you, God. We lay our yoke, our chains, our bondage, our religion, our fear at your feet. Set us free, Lord, so we can worship you with our whole lives. In Jesus' name, amen.